All right, so today we are looking at commodity future contracts. So like I said, commodity here, it can be metal. It can also refer to gold. It can also refer to wheat. It can refer to palm oil. It can also refer to cocoa. Any type of agricultural products that are imported and exported. But in the application of this course or this uh, uh, topic, we are going to be looking at oil. So we'll be focusing more on oil as a commodity future contract, or there could be other types. But our example, we focus on oil because oil has effect on so many other uh, uh, products. If the price of oil goes up, it will affect the price of so many things in the economy. So oil is very important. So the objective of this uh, lecture, you should understand the commodity future contract and also the contract specifications. Then you should also know how the prices of commodity future contract is determined. Then you should appreciate the applications of commodity future contract in aging. Now, if you take notes, you realize that in most of the discussion on future contract, whether it is stock index future contract, whether it is single index future contract, we always talk about aging. Aging, aging, because derivative is basically risk management tool. So, and one of the ways that you minimize your risk is by using aging. So aging will always feature in every of our topic. But that's the summary of taking this course. You are taking financial derivatives so that you can edge your loss, you can reduce your loss. You also notice that one of the features of a future contract is that it is standardized. From the first two lectures that we have already had, we, are, we differentiated between the forward contract and the future contract. So and one of the weakness of the forward contract is that the forward contract, uh, it is uh, over the counter traded. So meaning that uh, you, don't need, you don't have standardized process to follow. It is based on mutual agreement, but it can cause some problems. But in the case of the future contract, there is a contrast specification. So everything is stated clearly to avoid any complications in the course of uh, carrying out the contract. So it's very transparent. And it also has an organized exchange. Okay, commodity future contracts are agreements to buy or sell a raw material at a specific date in the future at a particular price. So from this definition, you will realize that it is similar to the definition we have provided in the previous lectures. The only, and the, there is a specific keywords that usually appear, agreement to buy or sell, always appear in the definition. Specific dates in the future always appear at a particular price, always appear. These are the keywords that appears whenever you are trying to define or explain future contract. The only difference here is that instead of uh, calling it financial future contract, we just call it commodity future contract. And these specifications makes the future contract to be preferred to the forward contract because everything is clearly stated from the very beginning. The contract is for a set amount. It specifies when the seller will deliver the asset. It's also set the price. So everything is transparent in the future contract. Some contracts allow a cash settlement instead of delivery. Now, because sometimes when you are trading in commodity, the commodity can be very bulky. So if you are supposed to deliver, let's say you're supposed to deliver many tons of, uh, or many barrels of oil, it can take a lot of time or it can take a lot of space. So instead of delivering the actual oil, you can also deliver the monetary equivalent of that particular oil. So it is possible also. 
or let's say you want to deliver uh, palm oil, if you want, you can choose the option of giving the cash equivalent of the palm oil. It's also acceptable. But if you want to deliver the palm oil, also acceptable. You can see it's, it's flexible. Especially during the pandemic, that many many of the many businesses are shut down. So it will have been difficult to carry your to deliver the uh, physical uh, raw materials. So the best option will have been through cash because during the pandemic, you can still be sending money because the banks still, still operate or many businesses do not operate. So you can see that the future, commodity future contract has taken into consideration the possibility that it, it may be difficult to actually deliver the raw materials. So you can use cash instead. So there are three main areas of commodities. One of them is food. This one has to do with agricultural produce, like palm oil, like cocoa. Then we have energy. Energy has to do with oil, oil price. And we also have metal. So these are the common area that is linked to commodity future contract. The most popular food futures are, for example, the meat. So they trade in meat. They also trade in wheat. They also trade in sugar. There are others, but these are the three common uh, agricultural related produce that are traded in the commodity future market. Most energy futures are, are for the oil and gasoline. So these are the two, there are others, but these are the two most commonly traded type of energy. Then we have the metals. Metals using the futures include gold, silver, and copper. So in the case of the assignment that you were given, the, 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 the trusted employee was actually trading in copper. Eventually, it created losses along the line. So buyers of food, energy, and metal use future contract to fix the price of the commodity they are purchasing. Basically, the idea of future contract is to fix your price so that you can minimize fluctuation in the prices. So once the price is fixed, so it enables you to minimize your losses. The fixing of prices reduce their risk that prices will go up. So in the case of the buyer, if the prices of the uh, uh, commodity goes up, it means that the buyer will spend more. But if the buyer is wise enough to fix the price earlier, let's say at 100 ringgit, if the price goes to 200 ringgit, then the buyer has succeeded in reducing the risk of paying at the higher prices. So this is how the buyer can use the commodity future contract to limit his uh, risk of rising prices in the future. On the other hand, the seller of these commodities use future contract to guarantee they will receive the agreed upon price. Basically, they remove the risk of a price drop. To the seller, they always like to sell when the price is high. But when the price is low, the seller is not always willing to sell. So in order for the seller to reduce his risk of price dropping too low and erode its revenue or profit, the seller can also agree on a price today. So if the seller agrees that the price, let's say is also 100 ringgit today. So if the price falls to 50 ringgit, the seller has succeeded in reducing his, uh, sorry, has succeeded in uh, eliminating his loss. So instead of selling at 50, he will sell at 100 because he has already agreed and fixed the price at which he will sell in the future. So you can see that the buyers and the sellers, they benefit by using commodity future contract. Of course, along the line, things might go the other, other, in other direction. So they might end up losing if price doesn't go the way they predict. But at least in a way, their risks are reduced. So prices of commodities change on a weekly or even on a daily basis, especially due to inflation. So when you buy a commodity today, after two, three months 
or even sometimes on a daily and weekly basis, you will notice that the prices are changing very rapidly, especially in many developing countries where there is, there is no price control. You will see prices increasing at the rate of 30, 40%. In some part of Asia, the prices are relatively stable. From my observation of Malaysia, prices, although it has changed over the years, but if you calculate the percentage change, it's not too big compared to what you observe when you see prices changing in other developing countries. I know of some countries in, the, in, in developing countries where prices can increase by 30%, even within just a month. So contract prices also change as well. That is why the cost of meat, gasoline, and gold change just so often. So because of this uh, possibility that prices of commodity can change, so it is not surprising to see that the price of gas, the price of gold has, uh, has changed drastically in recent times. Now, in the commodity future contract, there's always an underlying asset. Uh, remember, in the case of the financial uh, future contract, the underlying asset is stock. It can be bond, it can be treasury bills. But in the case of commodity future contract, the underlying asset refers to the commodity itself. So if the price of the co underlying commodity goes up, the buyer of the future contract makes money. Right, because he has contracted to buy at a fixed price. So if the price goes up, he has succeeded in making money. He gets the product at the lower, at the lower price and can now sell it at today's higher market price. On the other hand, if the price of the underlying commodity goes down, the future seller will make money. Why will he make money? Why? Because he has fix his price, let's say at 100. So if the price goes down, it's still safe. Beside that, he can even buy the commodity at today's lower price and sell it in the future again at a higher price. So this is how both the buyer and the seller can take advantage of the commodity future contract to reduce their risk and also increase their revenue. So this commodity future contract is also widely traded especially for countries that engage in export, export of goods and services. All right, so this commodity future contract, uh, it doesn't appear in the textbook. So I got it from different sources combined together. That is why you see it is different from the previous uh, slide. So I combine it together because I know it is equally important, but the textbook was focusing more on financial, not commodity. So if commodity traders have to deliver the product, few people will do it. Instead, they can fulfill the contract by delivering proof that the product is in the warehouse. Have I explained the fifth one? Okay, I've explained this. Okay, so this is the one. Instead, they can fulfill the contract by delivering proof that the product is in the warehouse. They can also pay the cash difference or provide another contract at the market price. Okay, so because commodity is very heavy and sometimes it involves large quantity. So as long as you can show picture or you can show evidence or proof that you have the product in the warehouse, it, it is considered acceptable. Then they can still allow you to enter into the contract. So you don't have to carry all the uh, product in your, on your head and go and show to the clearing house that you have the product. No, just show. Take pictures, send to them, use all type of proofs to show that you have the product in the warehouse. Then you can be allowed to buy or to sell. Instead of going through all this hustle, you can also pay in cash. So cash can also be used in place of delivering the real product. So you have two options. And this also helped to improve the liquidity, the liquidity in the commodity future contract because cash makes things much more easier. It's easier to, to transfer money from one person to the other 
compared to carrying bulky products. It takes time and energy. So future contracts are traded on a commodity future exchange. This include Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the Chicago Board of Trade, and the New York Mercantile Exchange. So these are the established uh, commodity exchanges in the world. And like what we have discussed, under the financial uh, future contract, we emphasize the importance of the exchange. The exchange play a significant role. So the, with the exchange, the buyer and the seller do, don't, doesn't need to see each other. The exchange will be in the middle. The exchange will guarantee any default from both parties. So the exchange basically take the risk of the buyer and the seller together in order to ensure that there is confidence and there is transparency in the commodity uh, uh, market. All of these exchanges, they have now been combined into one. They are called uh, group. Oh, just mute yourself if noise is coming from your side so that it doesn't disturb others. So all of these exchanges, they are now grouped under one. Chicago Mercantile Exchange. The Commodity Future Trading Commission now regulates them. Now it is important to regulate them. Why? Because some buyers or sellers may want to uh, defraud or they may want to manipulate the market as shown in our case study. The case study assignment I gave to you, you can see that one of the trusted uh, employee of Sumitomo Derivatives actually tried to manipulate the market. He was able to do that for a very long time until it backfired. So because of this possibility of some individuals trying to play some pranks in the market, there is need to regulate the commodity future uh, market. So buyers and sellers must register with the Commodity Futures Trading Commission in their respective country. So what is the role of the exchange? The role of the exchange is important in providing a safer trade. Yeah, just like we explained in the previous slide, that the presence of the exchange improves liquidity in the market. It also helps to build confidence of both the buyer and the seller because the risk is passed on to the exchange. The contract go through the exchange clearing house. So the, the exchange, they have a system that they use to clear the trade in such a way that the buyer and the seller doesn't need to see each other. One person can be in the US, another person can be in Malaysia, and they can enter into a contract without knowing each other. All they just need to do is to pass through their respect, uh, the clearing house, and everything will be sorted out. So technically, the clearinghouse buys and sells the contract. So in a way, if we want to make it more explicit, the clearinghouse actually is doing the buying, is doing the selling, because the clearinghouse is actually buying from the buyer and selling to the seller. So basically doing everything for them, so easy. So the exchange make contract easier to buy and also sell by making them interchangeable. So it is possible for the buyer and the seller to sell without seeing each other but they must be for some commodity, for same commodity, quantity and quality. Now, you remember one of the advantage of the future contract is that it has standardized specifications. And these standardized specifications help to ensure that uh, things are organized. The commodity that the buyer and the seller are trading must be the same. The quantity must be the same quantity the buyer and the seller wants. And the quality must also be the same quality the buyer and the seller wants. So if the buyer and the seller, they are in agreement with all of this, then a contract is entered into. This is to ensure standardization in the market. They must also be for the same delivery month and location. This is also important because both parties must agree on a particular location and the location must be agreed upon by both parties and also the delivery month. So if the seller wants to deliver after six months, but the buyer wants delivery in three months, they cannot 
go into the contract because they don't have the same delivery month. So it is important the buyer and the seller must also have same months. That is, they want the product at the same time, period. Okay, the world has changed, especially following the pandemic that started in 2019, early 2019, or is it late 2019? Yeah, late 2019, entering into early 2020. So a lot of things has changed. Commodity prices continued their recovery in the first quarter of 2021, after going through a lot of declining prices, especially throughout 2020 with four-fifths of commodity now above their pre-pandemic level. So after the, immediately the pandemic started, a lot of products, the demand was very low. As a result, price declined. And this affected a lot of businesses in virtually every sector of the economy, except those who are in the IT, like the Zoom, uh, they are the ones that enjoyed during the pandemic. For many companies, they really suffered during the pandemic. But immediately, the recovery started. Four fifths of the commodity are now selling above their pre pandemic level, but it is still not good as it was before the pandemic. So, prices have been lifted by the global recovery from last year's recession, improved growth prospects, and commodity specific supply factors for crude oil, copper, and several food, especially for the crude oil. There was a time the price of the crude oil went into negative. I, I saw the news. Can you, can you ever imagine that the price of a commodity can be negative? But it happens during the pandemic. It happens because people were not actually taking delivery anymore. And the, the producer of oil, they have to deliver before they can produce a new one. So they need space. They need to clear off the old one and produce new one. But nobody is buying. So they need to just give out the oil free so that they can, they can store the new one. So you can see prices went as far as negative. But after some time, they recovered. So this, this tells you the extent to which risk can affect businesses. And there is need to use appropriate aging techniques to minimize this risk. So looking ahead, oil prices are forecast to average 56 barrel in 2021. So there are some analysts that they use information today and how the economy would likely look in the future. They can use it to predict what the future will look like in 2021. They can also use it to predict what it will look like in 2022. But these forecasts are not accurate. Sometimes, they may, they may fall short of the expectations. But at least it helps to have an idea of how the market will look like in the next year. If you have good knowledge of what will happen in 2022, you can make better decisions today. Unfortunately, most of us do not have exact knowledge of what will happen next year. But based on what is happening this year, or especially October, November, December, we can have rough idea how January, February, March of 2022 will be. We can tell in a way. So they do all this to make better decision against the coming year. So many intermediate, intermediaries in the commodity chain who are naturally long, that is buying, may lose considerable money unless they edge. So you can see edging is what can help to minimize especially when the prices of commodity are declining. With appropriate aging techniques, you can minimize your losses. You can minimize your losses. So aging is very important in financial derivatives. On-edge sellers may experience large losses if the price falls. So this one happened to the, in the case of the case study that I gave to you. So it happened and they made a lot of losses. So if your you use the wrong edging techniques or you don't edge at all, you can have a large losses that can collapse the entire business. Decreasing prices 
creates an opportunity for buyers of food and oil to lock in lower prices. So when the prices are decreasing, it favors the buyer, but it doesn't favor the seller. So the seller can lose a lot of money. The world has changed. Metal prices are expected to average 30% higher in 2021 compared to 2020. Why? Because of strong demand. But it will drop back somewhat in 2022 because demand, when there is demand for a product, it means the price may likely go up because prices are determined by the forces of demand and supply. So when the demand for metal, for example, is rising, there is potential that the price for metal may increase in the future. But if the demand is very low, then the price is unlikely to increase in the future. Although metal only account for around 7% of global commodity consumption, metal, especially the copper and aluminum are a major source of export revenue for around one third of emerging market. So most emerging market, especially developing economy, they still rely more on metal related products. Also, agriculture prices are forecasted to average nearly 14% higher in 2021, driven by a few food commodities, but they are expected to stabilize. The pandemic has affected most of this product, but the forecast is good for this coming year. In all of this, the main risk to the price forecast are the evolution of the pandemic. Now, all of these predictions may or may not happen, depending on whether we'll have the fourth wave of the pandemic. If the pandemic continues again next year, another lockdown, we don't pray for it. Well, all of this forecast is based on the assumption that the pandemic will die down continuously. But if it doesn't die down, then all of this prediction will not be accurate. So anyone that uh, make a position in the forward or in the future contract based on these predictions may lose a lot of money. So constantly and revise your, uh, uh, you, you revise your investment accordingly. The main risk to the price forecast are the evolution of the pandemic for industrial commodity. Why for the agriculture, you have problem of weather shock. There are some countries now that are experiencing uh, unfavorable weather. And this unfavorable weather is affecting the agricultural production in those countries. So those countries has to rely on other countries to grow their food. So like I said, future contract is standardized to avoid uh, confusion between the buyer and the seller. So example of how this specification looks like, you can see there's a symbol, the contract, is stated to be traded in crude oil. The exchange name is mentioned. The ticker size also is mentioned. The daily limit is mentioned. The contract size is already stated, 1,000 US barrel. So all of these specifications is to ensure transparency, no confusion. Once you see it, you are okay with it, you go into it. If all of these are not stipulated, it will be difficult to, to actually uh, make the contract to be each free. So commodity futures accurately assess the price on an open market. Now, the pricing of the commodity future contract depends on the interaction of demand and supply between the buyer and the seller. And this is transparent because it is done in an open market. Unlike in the forward contract, it is not transparent, but the future market is transparent. They also forecast the value of the commodity into the future because there are experts in the commodity market. They can even predict what is going to happen in the next two, three, four, five years. Of course, it may not always happen that way, but based on experience, they may be 80% or 70% accurate in their forecast, because forecasting is predicting, it cannot always be 100%. But at least if you know 70% of how the future will look like, it's equally as good than having zero knowledge. So with this forecast knowledge, it can also be used to determine prices today and in the future. So the values are set 
by traders and also analysts. So these traders, they are uh, certified traders and they trade in the market. There are also analysts who are also professionals that also trade, uh, that also analyze the information in the future, uh, in the commodity market. They spend all their day, in fact, they spend every day researching their particular community. So there are some professionals that are experts when it comes to financial derivative and also commodity derivatives. They spend day, every day doing research. Why? Because they know that this research will inform their decision in subsequent years. So forecast instantly, incorporate each day news. Why are they doing this research? They are doing this research so as to track information on daily basis. So any news in a day is quickly incorporated into the price. So let's say if the price is 100, uh, 100 ringgit, for example, if there is a, a news that was disseminated that very day, they will adjust, they will adjust the price. It may be adjusted upward of the news, depending on whether the news is good news or bad news. If it is good news, the price will likely go up. If it is bad news, the price will likely go down. For example, if a country faces a threat of political uncertainty, for example, election violence, the commodity prices will change drastically. So derivative price setting is also affected by what is happening around the world, what is happening in each country. So this knowledge is very important. Sometimes commodity features reflect the emotion of the trader or the market more than supply and demand. Ideal situation, it is supply and demand that ought to determine the price in ideal situation. But sometimes we have seen the emotion of the trader or the, or the market as a whole. Uh, this can sometimes replace the conventional demand and supply. It shouldn't happen in a normal market. It shouldn't happen, but sometimes it happens. And when it happens, it can cause some instability in the commodity future market, especially speculators. Uh, these speculators, they can really cause problem in any market. That is why in some countries, they, they outrightly ban speculators. Why most of the Western countries, I think they, they, they allow speculation. I think in Asia, most countries in Asia don't allow speculation. But in the, in the Western world, they do allow speculations. So speculators, what do they do? They beat up prices on necessary uh, uh, problem and just because they want to make profit, selfish reason. If a crisis occurs and they anticipate a shortage, so if they anticipate that there will be shortage, they will just create one problem that will just push up the prices and they can make profit. When other traders see that the price of a commodity is rising, they also create a bidding war. They will follow because people tend to follow the expert. So if the speculators are bidding up, then others too will follow. They will think, okay, it's a speculator, it's an expert up for that. So there will be a price war in the market. And in the case study I gave you, something like this was actually happening. It was happening. That drives the price even higher. If everybody is bidding, just like the speculator is bidding, the price will go higher further. But the basics of supply and demand have not changed. When the crisis is over, prices will plummet back to normal. Now, this is already established in the uh, financial derivative and also in commodity uh, derivatives that the demand and supply still play their role. Temporarily, speculators can do some prank, can play some pranks to make some profit, but eventually the price will come back to normal. And it's because of the forces of demand and supply. So sometimes those who are trying to speculate, they forget that the price will go back to normal. So if you are carried away in these prices going up, before you realize, you might end up losing money. You might end up losing money. So the price will adjust. No matter how high, it will revert back to the normal based on the demand and supply. Okay, so I think I'm here. So traders usually take into account all information about oil supply and demand, as well as geopolitical consideration. So in determining the price of a commodity future contract, in, for example, oil, there is need to take into consideration supply as well as demand. And not only that, there is need to consider 
geopolitical consideration that is what is happening in that uh, economy is, is there expectation of election crisis so all of this will affect the price of the commodity future uh, contract this affect oil prices it is this assumption behind oil prices that affect the economy so significantly because oil is linked to many things if there is an increase in the price of oil many products will shoot up and you'll see the seller telling you there's inflation, price of oil has gone up, cost of uh, input has gone up. As a result, they have to adjust their prices to reduce their own cost. The price of oil impacts every goods and services produced in a country. For example, oil prices affect gasoline prices directly because 54% of gasoline price is dependent on the price of crude oil. So many things are linked to crude oil. For example, if the price of uh, oil goes up, the cost of filling your car will go up. So if those who are taking Uber to, maybe Uber to may need to adjust their prices. Why? Because there's an increase in oil prices. So oil prices can create a lot of problem if the price is not checked. A rise in the crude oil prices will raise the pump price of petrol as well. And once the pump price of petrol goes up, it affects a lot of businesses, so they will also increase their final price of their product. So there is a real-world example regarding pricing of commodity contract. In January 2020, the world government began restricting travel and closing businesses. So this is the outcome of the COVID-19 pandemic. All governments in different countries impose restrictions, they close down business, and this make the economy weaker. And because of this, all these uh, problems, demand for oil fell because nobody is buying oil anymore. In the first quarter of 2020, oil consumption was 5.6% lower than the first quarter of 2019. To make this even worse, the supply glut, supply glut meat on sold oil was made even worse by competition between Russia and OPEC. So Russia and OPEC, they are also having some trying to see who controls the market of oil. But Russia also has oil. So all of this further make the price of oil to really go down. Because if the supply is more than demand, price will go down significantly. On March 6, Russia announced it would increase production in April to maintain the market share. OPEC also announced it will also pump more oil. Uh, this, is not, this, this should not happen ideally, but they are trying to prove who is controlling the oil market. Unfortunately, price even fell even further. On April 12, 2020, OPEC and Russia agreed to lower output to support price. So you can see that sometimes trying to play some pranks may even work in the negative direction. Despite the disagreement between this OPEC and Russia, eventually the price even went down further. So both parties are losing money. So to reduce their losses, they have to agree, so settle their fighting. But why are they doing this? They are doing this so that they can lower output. So when you lower output, then supply will reduce. So when supply reduces, uh, the price is likely to go up because prices are determined by the interaction of demand and supply. So when supply is more than demand, price will likely go down. But when demand is more than supply, price will go up. So in the case of the pandemic, nobody is buying. So the best thing they can do is to reduce the supply, cut the output. So when they cut the output, at least the price will appreciate a bit. All right, so we will uh, we'll stop here. Then we'll continue. Let me see. Okay, let's finish this part. So we will we'll stop here. The situation was exacerbated about a week later. All right, uh, this part is interesting. A week later, after they resolved their disagreement, as traders looking to hoi forward expiring future contract, and they are trying to avoid physical delivery of oil, they even push the price of a barrel of oil down further. You can see, although initially, the OPEC and the Russia, they think that they are the ones that determines the price of commodity in the commodity uh, market. Yes, they do to some extent. Unknown to them, there's another force at play, that is, those who are actually trading in the, uh, in the uh, future contract. So they also refuse to 
take delivery, they extended their future contract. So by extending it, it also further push the price of oil downward. So you can see the price even went as low as minus. This is abnormal. So this one means that the seller is paying you to buy his product. Does it make sense? The seller is paying you to buy the product. It happens. So that tells you the extent to which price can decline. And once you see a price getting to minus, uh, it's a serious problem. But this will not last for long. It will not last for long. However, this historical anomaly was short-lived. The price quickly moved back into the positive territory and was trading at around 40 by June. So this is already established by research that when there is abnormal price situation in the market for commodity or any other uh, product, it will not last for long. So after some time, when the cost of this uh, decline or negative loss is removed, the price will adjust back. So the knowledge of this will help you not to over-celebrate for those who are gaining when the price is minus. So if you over-celebrate, then you forget that the price will adjust back up. You can see the adjustment also is as close to the decline. All right, so we'll stop here. So we continue, 7.30. Okay. Yeah. You have any question? You have any question? All right. So see you seven thirty. All right, so it is possible. So it is possible to have uh, a significant decline in the prices of oil, especially if there is a pandemic or there is a crisis. So prices can really be negative, but it will not last for a very long time. It will correct itself. It's already proven by research. So those that knows about this. They will, not uh, they will not celebrate the negative price for too long. They will just try to uh, wait for the time that the price will recover back to positive. All right, so the endogenous stamp structure of the future prices. So this information is on the direction of prices in the commodity market. So there are some key terminologies that is used to describe uh, this uh, uh, term structure. They use contango, they use backwardation. So for example, for low oil prices, the market is considered to be in contango. That is, the term structure is upward sloping. So upward sloping uh, is a, a, a curve that is going upward. Yeah, the curve is rising. So it's an indication that the price will likely to reach up, it is likely to rise. So as shown by the upward sloping curve. So contango is a situation where the oil price is expected for the expiration date increases with the maturity of the future contract. So basically the price of the future contract is likely to increase in the future. So that's the key point here. For the medium oil prices, the time structure of the future prices can be slightly humped. So slightly humped means that it can, it can be inverted U. Uh, inverted you. Then for oil, for high oil price, backwardation is the opposite of this pattern. So backwardation occurs when the oil price is expected for the expiration date decline with the maturity of the future market. So that is the price of the future market is expected to decline in the future. Contango, the price of the future uh, contract, future contract is expected to rise in the future. So it's opposite. So oil future prices exhibit mean reversion. So mean reversion means that if a price is high low today, it will be high later tomorrow or in the future. So if a price is high today, it will go back to the low value in the future. So they call it mean reversion. So the price is not always in its lowest form. It will come back to go up. If it is low, it will increase. So the knowledge of this information will help uh, uh, participants in the future market 
not to see low prices or not to over celebrate low prices because the price will eventually increase later on. And those who are already enjoying rising prices, they should not over celebrate because the prices will also come back to the normal position. All right, so there is always risk, especially what we have noticed considering this pandemic, nobody thought that risk can occur through the health sector. Most of the time we, we, we experience risk either from the financial sector or we experience risk from the exchange rate problem. But this time around, it, it wasn't coming from the mark, uh, financial market. It came from the health sector via the pandemic. So there is need to deal with risk because we don't know what type of risk will, will happen next year or in few years time. So there's always need for a measures to minimize our risk. So we need to perceive the risk. What type of risk is likely to occur in the future? We need to do risk assessment. We need to assess the risk. So after assessing the risk, so what is the right strategy to use? So once you get the right strategy, then you go for the risk management. If you don't perceive the risk and you don't assess the risk, then how will you want to manage the risk? So you have to do the perception first, then you assess the risk, only then you decide which the right instrument to use. If you assess wrongly and you choose the wrong instrument, it can increase your risk, as shown in the case study that you have with you now. So how do we reduce this risk? To reduce this risk, there is opportunity for edging. So you can edge, your products. And by engaging in aging, you can reduce or minimize the losses that you can incur. A commercial contract, which limits the impact of advanced price movement, which might take place between buying or incurring production costs as well as selling. So aging helps you to minimize adverse effect of adverse price movement. Market intermediary, for example, the exporter, cannot survive repeated years of trading losses. So if your losses is occurring every year, you have to do something, you have to edge to minimize your losses. So sellers also cannot survive repeated years of defaults from borrowers. So both the seller and the buyer, they need to edge their exposure. So oil price in particular is highly volatile. So volatility means highly risky. The price fluctuates. Therefore, you need to edge, especially if your company is, uh, is affected by oil prices. If the increase in oil price affects your company significantly, you need to do some edging to minimize the risk. So oil prices are volatile and hard to predict. As a result, exposure to oil prices may harm businesses. How can it harm the businesses? For example, uncertain revenues linked to oil export may lead to shelving or reducing plant projects or wasteful use of windfall revenue. So if there is an uncertain revenue and this uncertain revenue is linked to oil exportation, so it means that it has reduced uh, the, the profitability of this uh, exporting business. So this might cost, cost them to reduce projects that can bring more money to the company. And they may also need to use their excess reserve in order to reduce the adverse effect of the oil uh, decline, for example. So what can be done? There is need to edge. Edging also help to stabilize our cash flow. So cash flow is very, very important, especially during this pandemic period. A lot of people face cash, cash flow problem, both businesses and individuals because the, pan the pandemic extended for too long and people exhausted their reserve. So edging allow us to lock in our prices in advance or specify a particular range to minimize cash flow problem. Substantially, it also reduces volatility of revenue. So when you do edging, it enables you to reduce the fluctuation in your revenue. Edging also reduces the risk of solid financial loss due to adverse market movement. So when you do the right edging, you apply the right edging, you can minimize your risk 
arising from declining prices, oil prices, or increasing oil prices. There are two ways that you can do this edging. You can do the edging using self-insurance. You can also use another method called edging with the market. So the self-insurance, what you do, oil revenue in excess of a predefined average level are saved. So savings are used to complement oil revenue when they fall below average. So this one is a simple uh, risk management tool, especially for countries that uh, rely heavily on oil to finance their budget. So what they need to do in those periods when the prices of oil is high and they are making a lot of revenue, a lot of profit, they need to have a, a reserve. They will keep that reserve so that if at a, at a different time, there's a decrease in the, uh, in the price of oil, they can use their savings to minimize their, uh, the adverse effect of the decline in the oil. So this is called self-insurance. And this also applies also to individuals. Individuals who are working, you are expected to have at least uh, three months of your salary in your savings. Why do they say that? Because it enables you to minimize your, your exposure to a sudden job loss so that when you lose your job, for example, and you have three months of your salary in your account, at least you can still use, use it for some time before you get a new job because it takes time applying, waiting for interview. Uh, so it is advisable, minimum, minimum, three months salary must be in your savings. So similar principle, during the oil boom, it's safe. So when the price of the oil decline, you use the revenue from the oil boom, at least to continue the, uh, the production until the price will increase later on. Another method that is used to edge is called edging with the market. So oil revenues can be fixed using the future contract or flood for future date using market instruments. So this is the most commonly used one, but this is also uh, valid. It has been used for centuries. The second method is usually more efficient. Why? Because this involves the use of uh, derivatives, such as future contract. If you don't edge, if some people, they are so confident, that everything will be normal. They rely on prayer. Prayer is good, but sometimes you pray, you also edge. Some people rely on only prayer. They don't edge. So if you only pray, you don't edge, what can happen? Ah, you are exposed to losses. You can see this region. It's a region of loss. But the losses may sometimes take time. Maybe when things improve, you can start to make profit. But if you don't edge, you are exposed to larger losses. You can see the losses can go as high as minus 10. And if this is in billions, that means you are losing 10 billions, for example. So positive region, negative region. But if you edge, your loss may be reduced. So maybe zero or something minus five if you edge. But if you don't edge, you can have higher losses. That is if you don't edge. So who are those that edge and why do they edge? So those that edge, for example, we have the end users, we have the producers, we also have the traders and distributors. So all of this, they edge with different purpose. In the case of the end users, who are mostly the airline, industrial, ship, road transportation, they are worried about rising prices because rising prices will affect their operation. So they edge. There are also producers, Producers, they are concerned about falling prices because if the price is falling, uh, it's a, it, it, they incur some losses. So they want to edge their exposure. Then we have the traders and the distributors. They are also exposed to risk. Uh, this risk is related to the timing and also the basis risk. So this basis risk arises from mismatch between the purchase price and the sales price. Sometimes the purchase price and the sales price may be different from what you anticipated. So you want to minimize your risk arising from these uh, price changes. So these are the reasons why people edge. So to summarize what we have done today, we have looked at another aspect of uh, uh, 
derivatives called commodity derivatives. Although the emphasis of this course is on financial derivatives, but we still need to familiarize ourselves with commodity derivatives. So that is why also it is given to you as an assignment so that you, you know what is happening in the commodity future contract. So when you hear someone talking about commodity, commodity future contract, at least you have something to say. But in the exams, emphasis will be placed on the financial, financial derivatives, not this commodity. This one will not come in your exam. All right, any question? So I expected you now to... Uh, professor, hello. All right, yeah, I can hear you. Where, where we can find in the record of the lectures? The, pardon? The recorded of uh, the lectures last uh, okay, The last weeks. one, I uploaded it in, the, in, in my Zoom channel. I sent a link, check the, oh. uh, check the WhatsApp chat. I sent a link, you can download it there. Usually there are right. videos that I uploaded, or you will see the I use the, the name of the lecture so that it will be easier for you to see. So you can just download from All right. the link there for it. Is there. By your All right. channel and Zoom. All right. so upload to this phone also. For, I will upload it in the channel. Right. Any other question? So if there is no other question, you still remember one week has gone. So your assignment due date uh, is coming. So it's better you start earlier. And also make sure individually you, you also read uh, the case study because sometimes I can pick one or two questions from the case study I put in the, in the exam, just to be sure that you also read the case study. So don't think that since it is group assignment, then the group leader will do all the work. You'll be surprised in the test, I will just take any two questions. I will put it there. Uh, so, better to be involved in the assignment and know what is happening in the case study. All right, so, see you. Professor, 